There you go, sir. Thank you. Um, a little hole in the ground, a lot of science with it. Um, these uh, uh, hunters knew about this for years. It was just a, a place where they met. They actually found deer drinking out of it. And it was only a couple of years ago that one of the hunters uh, noticed some metal objects around the uh, room of the crater and brought it into Dr. Hurd at uh, the University of uh, Alberta. And through that, they've uh, documented, yes, in fact, it is an impact. It happened 1,130 years ago, plus or minus a couple of years. And uh, the reason they know that is the carbon-14 uh, of the charcoal buried by the ejecta. The dimension, 36 meters, 6 meters deep. And I give you uh, an idea of the scale. You can see Jillian and I sitting down in there, having a good time in a crater. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if this works. There we go. You sure know how to show a girl a good time. <laughs> hey, I'll tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you. Well, uh, what happens in the crater stays in the yeah. <laughs> Not anymore. Not anymore, yeah. We're, we got it on film. It's on film. <laughs> <laughs> so where it is, uh, this is uh, Alberta, uh, Edmonton, and White Court is just to the northwest of... Uh, uh, Edmonton, and the crater itself is so 20 kilometers or so just south of it. These are tracks that I made with my um, personal locator beacon on the airplane, and we circled the crater, and I'll show you some pictures in a bit. But uh, it, as I mentioned, there's lots of science with it. It is a brand new crater um, that has meteorites around it. It has an ejecta blanket. Um, the crater is well defined, it has a raised rim, and there were shock indicators, uh, pl uh, planar deformation features in, um, in some quartz that they found. The uh, bolide itself was about one meter uh, across, and uh, we'll get into that later. Uh, as I mentioned, there's lots and lots of science to do with this one. Uh, some dimensions, you can see the, uh, the contours and so on. And uh, this uh, image here is with uh, the technology LIDAR. Uh, the crater was not discovered by LIDAR, but uh, the crater was used to calibrate LIDAR, and I'll get into that as well. Uh, the ejecta blanket, you can see the, uh, the black uh, in, in, the, in these diagrams here, uh, with the, uh, a, the, the, the various um, uh, directions of uh, plotting the, uh, the, the ejecta and so on. The, uh, as I mentioned, the, the date of the crater was found by the charcoal buried underneath the ejecta, and uh, it is fairly uh, uh, true that, yes, it's about 1,130 years ago-ish. The uh, bolide itself, it impacted at an angle of about 40 to 55 degrees-ish, they, they suspect, and it came in from the southwest. The uh, meteors itself, the meteorites itself that we, uh, we found, uh, were found to the northeast of the crater, most of them, but you can see there's uh, 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 meteorites all over the place. And there's a, uh, a fantastic tale about these meteorites we'll get into in a second. The, uh, the square around it is a restricted area. You are not allowed to collect meteorites within that. And uh, part of the GA was um, a meteorite collection, and, we'll, and Jillian will uh, describe that. But I, I personally thought, oh, play, cripe, the, uh, the, the place is going to be hunted out. There's not going to be one left, but you'd be surprised what we found. So without further ado, I'll introduce my creator explorer, Jillian Sullivan. <laughs> Hi, I'm going to talk more about the, uh, the, the tour that we took of the crater itself. Um, this took place ju this past July 2nd, the day after the wrap-up of the 2012 RASC General Assembly in Edmonton. This was a rare opportunity to visit the crater, which is a well-hidden gem, and we were lucky to be among the 30 who registered for this full-day adventure. After a two-hour bus ride northwest from Edmonton to the town of Whitecourt, we began with an excellent presentation by Dr. Chris Hurd on the crater. Then it was off by bus again uh, until the road got too rough. The tour description had stressed that we needed to be in good shape and able to walk up to 90 minutes in rough terrain. Here we are at the start of our three kilometer hike into the crater site. 
Okay, the road soon turned into a hiking path and our Nordic walking poles really came in handy. The organizers had arranged for a set of ATV shuttles, which most people used. An article published in the White Court Star newspaper about our tour noted that due to the precariousness of the ride up, directions are not given out to tourists. So we really felt we were about to see something that very few people have a chance to see. I just want to mention too that Jillian and I were the only people that actually walked both ways. Everybody else took the uh, <laughs> buggies. <laughs> I just wanted to brag about it. <laughs> hey, Chuck, who took the picture? Um, you're oh, the only two. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> there were lots of us. Oh, you'll see in a second how many. So here, this is the impact site, believe it or not. Uh, it's taken from one rim, uh, with the far rim about two-thirds of the way up the photo. Uh, you can see the bottom of the crater where there's bare soil in the middle bottom of the photo. Uh, obviously, it's pretty much obscured in the leafiness of summer. It's much more visible in winter, but I'm glad we were there in summer. <laughs> Next slide. Uh, here's Chris Hurd standing just below the crater rim, explaining the direction and angle of the meteorite as it hit Earth. Uh, Chuck provided the technical title. <laughs> yeah, you can see the, the steepness of the crater, too. It's uh, very steep there. Gives a sense of the crater size with uh, tour members ranged along the crater rim. This was taken from down in. It was Jillian and uh, in Inside the crater. <laughs> okay, descending down into the crater. Finally, we got to go down and uh, check it out. It really felt quite uh, something being down in the bottom looking out of it. Um, once we got. Next slide. Okay, here we are at the bottom. And uh, Chuck used his GPS to mark the exact location so that we could look for it later by air, see if we could find it. Next slide. With the crater tour part over, we broke into small groups led by local experts to look for meteorites. This was, of course, outside the restricted zone that Chuck showed you a bit earlier, the area that you're not allowed to look for meteorites in. Uh, for a couple of hours, we had the use of metal detectors and magnets, and here the detector was whining loudly, so we knew we had something. Success. The last step of looking for a meteorite can be rooting around in the soil with a strong magnet, like the one here. You can see there's a small meteorite clinging to the head of the magnet. I was amazed there's wall-to-wall -wall magnet er, uh, <laughs> meteorites there. We were lucky in that our, t our um, expert, the fellow there in the sort of the, the gear in the middle, uh, had scoped out the area before, so we'd actually found some things in advance. Not everybody had that advantage. Okay, so here's uh, another spot where the metal detector was going wild, and uh, here's the result. Three small pieces of meteorite. We should mention that our metal detector and magnets also located a number of nails and wire, a legacy of the long gone homesteads in the area. Our little group was fortunate. Other groups found less or nothing at all. So we felt uh, very good. It's not the size that counts, eh, Jillian? <laughs> 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 Moving right along. Moving right along. After, <laughs> after a long day of, cr of crater exploration, there's nothing like a cold one at the White Court Casino. It was a day of contrast. It was unbelievable from a crater to a casino to back to Edmonton. The man at right is Murray Paulson of the Edmonton RASC and a veteran me White Court meteorite hunter. He has found hundreds and much larger than, than what we found. He also took care of the logistics for the tour, which went very smoothly. And while at the casino, tour members had a chance to meet the mayor of White Court and other dignitaries, and we all received golf shirts to commemorate the occasion. <laughs> it made quite a fuss. It was very nice. The, it was, the whole thing was very nicely done, and we arrived back in Edmonton late that night, tired and elated. Now back to Chuck and the magic of LiDAR. Okay. <laughs> yeah, stand back. We're going to do some science. Um, uh, you mentioned that the LIDAR was actually calibrated uh, with this crater. And you can see this is a, an aerial shot of the area of where the crater should be. It's right there, actually. And uh, with uh, the, the uh, 
I'm trying to think of the word here. The processing that they use, they can actually attenuate the noise from the images and just have uh, the ground reflections. And uh, using this technology in this crater, they've calibrated it and they've probably, uh, they're using it quite a bit now in other areas. Well, I don't think they found any other craters, but um, it's quite a strong technology. That is a, uh, a computer uh, a drawing from, from the data of the uh, LiDAR, and you can see the, uh, the shape. The, the, the meteorite again came in from this angle, and the meteorites that we found were in this area here. And again, for the record, we were outside the uh, magic box. The, uh, the, the crater itself, now, is very, very unique in the fact that I mentioned that it was a one <coughs> meteor, a one meter wide bolide that caused the crater. Now, there are meteorites uh, that, are, that we know of that are tons, uh, you know, a couple of meters across and so on. So here's what we're looking at. We're looking at various sizes of meteorites that, that arrive at terminal velocity going thud versus cosmic velocities which go to an explosion which caused these craters. And uh, again, it's the uh, explosion that caused the crater, not the impact. Basically, it's the energy, imp uh, energy transfer from the mass times velocity squared that causes the explosion, which causes the hole in the ground. So what we have is a, um, an example now of the minimum size, minimum velocity of a MV squared type crater. And Dr. Hur is pretty excited over this, and uh, uh, we, we might uh, have some more in, in, uh, papers about this in the future. Uh, aside from the meteorites themselves, so I'll, I'll, what I'll get into, first of all, Julian mentioned I, uh, I uh, got the GPS coordinates. We, we stood in the center, and I, I uh, zeroed the GPS, and uh, flew over the area, and lo and behold, you can see it there? We, uh, I couldn't see it either. Uh, so what I did, I just set the GPS up, uh, put it under the wing, and took a picture and hoped for the best. So, give up. There it is. So you can just barely see the, uh, the clearing in the bottom, and uh, this was the rim that we walked down. Uh, the area that we found all the meteorites was around here. And again, there's, uh, there's lots, to be f lots to be found there. But uh, to get in the air and look for it, it's impossible unless you know exactly where it is. Now, uh, as far as the bolide itself, now, when the impactor happened, uh, it was going about 10 kilometers a second, so that's below the escape velocity of this planet. I think it's around 12 kilometers plus. So essentially, it had slowed down in the atmosphere, but not slow enough not to prevent an explosion. But what had happened is that Parts of the bolide did come apart in the atmosphere, hence the meteorites that we found, which were typical meteorites with the little uh, indentations called regmoglyphs in, in them and so on. The meteorite that broke off the bolide on the explosion was a different uh, kettle of fish altogether. You see the difference here. This is a typical meteorite that came through the atmosphere, slowed down to terminal velocity and goes thud on the ground. Whereas this one here, it's a, like a shrapnel from, a, from an explosion, basically. And it came off the, uh, the bolide during the explosion. And uh, it, it, didn't, it didn't have the typical uh, indentations and so on. It had basically just like a metal that broke off from, a, from an explosion uh, of a metal object, basically. And um, so these are very unique. I don't think there's any other example anywhere else that we found. And fortunately, I've, I've uh, been able to grab that one. Um, and as well, uh, Dr. Hurd, from studying the uh, uh, Widmanstaten patterns within the uh, iron meteorite, he has determined that the uh, bolide uh, came from uh, an object or uh, an asteroid about 50 kilometers across. It's four and a half billion years old. And uh, just by the ratios of the uh, nickel in the Widmanstaten there, he calculated that the, um, this meteorite specific bolide that hit had cooled at 50 degrees uh, Celsius every million years. So from that they estimated that the bolide was, or the, the asteroid itself was over 50 kilometers across. So uh, as I mentioned, lots of science with this one and it was a very exciting trip. Uh, we had a great time and as we say, what happens in the crater stays in the crater. So we always finish with uh, how bright and beautiful a comet is as it flies past our planet, provided it does fly past it. Thank you.